Hello, I'm Dr. Gil Wilshire at Missouri Fertility in Columbia, Missouri. I'd like to thank Krista and Brenda and uh, those at Collectively Keto for inviting me to speak today. This is September 2019. This is Polycystic Ovarian Syndrome Awareness Month. So today we're going to weave Polycystic Ovarian Syndrome, uh, a keto lifestyle and, and a dietary uh, pattern and some current events into what should, I hope will be a very interesting uh, talk for you. Uh, the Keto Keetup today, uh, the Keto Meetup uh, today is a wonderful opportunity for us to address a number of these issues. Now, you'd think in 2019 there'd be a lot of science regarding nutritional advice and nutritional policies in this country. Unfortunately, nutrition is a very difficult subject to study and getting very definitive, hard science, uh, Good, strong answers for dietary policies, unfortunately, is very difficult. You can't just flip a coin and have a thousand people do one thing or another for the next 40 years to see what happens. Uh, most information or nutritional advice has come from uh, what are called observational studies, uh, where they <clears throat> ask questionnaires, they ask people, what did you eat the other day, what did you eat the other week, and they try to correlate these things, but as you know, recollections are not perfect. Uh, people don't write down what they, they write down what you want to hear. So these types of observational studies are, are uh, uh, not very powerful and they've, they've given us some misleading uh, information and misleading uh, uh, ideas in the past. When it comes to how much water to drink, how much fiber to eat, how much salt to eat, there's actually very little good, hard, strong scientific data to make strong recommendations, despite what you might see on Google. Uh, for the past 40 years, we've been told that dietary fat and cholesterol are bad for us. Unfortunately, this was never based on uh, good evidence. In fact, there was a, a very good study done in the 70s that was just rediscovered. They, were, they found boxes of data that were all dusty, had never been analyzed formally and published because the results showed there was no adverse effects of dietary fat and cholesterol. And only recently did this data come out and was analyzed properly. Um, since the time I made this slide, a study just came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine that's, that looked at all the data and said, look, uh, red meat, processed meat's probably not bad for you. And if it is, the result, the, uh, uh, it's, it's tiny, if it's anything. And uh, the uh, nutritional community's been up in arms. Uh, people from Harvard and Stanford have just been uh, uh, rolling over themselves to saying that, gee, this is terrible science. And uh, if you look at their rebuttals that have just come out in the last few days, uh, one of the uh, arguments was, well, gee, we don't have very good data, so uh, uh, you, know, you can't make these definitive statements. And, and the whole point is that if we've never had good data, why have we made these nationwide, system-wide policy recommendations based on poor data? And uh, it's very disappointing. Uh, Nevertheless, what most people understand is good nutrition is in fact just wrong or not based on good science. Um, one thing I'll be talking about a little bit later is that they've always said, they've not always said, that people have been saying for a long time that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, that was never based on science either. And if you're trying to lose weight, breaking your fast in the morning might be one of the worst decisions you can make. Uh, so. Um, is breakfast the word the best day of the best uh, uh, most important meal of the day? Clearly not. Now it turns out that people giving nutritional advice frequently have ulterior motives. Uh, there are there's a backstory behind what they're saying. Um, there are some religions that pr propose or pr profess a, a, a vegan or a vegetarian lifestyle. Now I'm all for people choosing to eat what they want to eat. I'm fine with that. I realized that, uh, for example, uh, recently The Lancet came out with, with strong recommendations to eat a plant-based diet. The Lancet is a big medical journal uh, out of the United Kingdom in uh, England, Britain. And uh, a friend of mine, Nina Tesholz, looked at the uh, board that made these recommendations, and it turns out 80% of them are vegan or vegetarian, and they're making uh, recommendations based on their own personal beliefs, not necessarily the science, uh, which is uh, uh, very disappointing. Now, I have a personal interest in this uh, subject. I used to weigh 370 pounds. I used to be about this big. I used to need to buy two seats to get on an airplane. 
And there's no pictures of me at 375, but here's me at around 340 pounds. This is me down to around 225. How was, I, how was I able to do this? Well, I was stuck to a very uh, strict uh, ketosis-based uh, uh, diet for about a year and a half. Lost about 130 pounds in one shot. And uh, like anybody else, I struggle from time to time. My weight goes up and down depending on how I'm doing. Um, but I have a personal interest in this, and I was able to take most of the weight off uh, doing what we're going to talk about today. Now, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a condition that creates subfertility, or what some people think is infertility, and I see this all the time in my practice. It's one of the large, most common diagnoses here in my practice. This is a fairly typical appearing woman with PCO. Now, this woman has put all her weight in the midsection. She has slender thighs. So this is what we call an apple-shaped body. This is one of the more severe manifestations of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now you need to realize this is not a black and white diagnosis. Polycystic ovarian syndrome runs on a continuum. There's some women that are very mild, and in fact, we're not quite sure if they rule in. They're, they're on that borderline there. And there's some women such as, such as this that come in, they never menstruate. They've got uh, bothersome facial hair growth, maybe diabetes, maybe high blood pressure too. And it's very easy to make a diagnosis here. Now. One of the ways we diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome is on, on ultrasound, these ovaries have a very classic appearance. Now this appearance does not go away uh, with nutritional changes, but the action or the function of the follicles in the ovaries does improve dramatically. And these follicles, which I call frustrated follicles, will frequently begin to ovulate normally when you lower insulin levels and uh, lower inflammation. Now. In order to have polycystic ovarian syndrome, a woman has to have two of three criteria. She has to have irregular ovulation, which manifests as irregular menses. She has to have signs of uh, increased hair growth or acne, or, and she needs to have one of the three criteria might include polycystic ovaries and ultrasound. So women come in all different flavors. You can have this and this, or this and this. There's eight different what are called phenotypes, uh, and they all rule in for what's called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, here's a woman with severe metabolic disease. She's probably been given advice to eat, for example, whole grain bagels and low-fat cream cheese, um, maybe low-calorie. Uh, this uh, woman's giving her advice to eat like that because that's been the, the recommendation for decades now. And unfortunately, she may be losing some weight, but she's not losing fat. This woman is losing muscle. Her thighs are shrinking. Her buttocks are shrinking. She's losing protein, she's losing lean body mass, she's not losing the fat. This is what we want to lose. So remember, you don't want to lose weight, you want to lose fat. These are two different things. Now, someone may be labeled as obese due to, to their height and their weight. It just gives you a, 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 a parameter called body mass index or the BMI. And I'm here to tell you the BMI is not the only criterion you need to evaluate if someone's overweight. Here, for example, is maybe the greatest bodybuilder of all time, Ronnie Coleman. And Ronnie, in this picture, is about 3% body fat, yet he has a body mass index of 40, which would make him morbidly obese if all you were looking at was the BMI. The reason his BMI is so high is that muscle is heavy, bone is heavy. If you have a sturdy woman uh, with lots of muscles due to her high testosterone levels and her basic underlying PCOS genetics, she's going to have her have a higher BMI than normal, and that might be normal for her. So you cannot necessarily go by BMI alone. Uh, this works for women too. Uh, this woman here would be classified as overweight. Clearly, she's not. Now, women come from different ethnic backgrounds. They have different body types. This is a woman I admire very much. Her name is Mirna. Valerio, apparently she's called the Mirinator. She's an ultra-marathon athlete. She runs over mountain ranges. She can run all day and all night. And this is her body type. This is her in fighting form uh, with a BMI of 38. So if your body type uh, runs in this direction, uh, do not be fooled or, or misled by your BMI. You can have a, a body type this, a BMI that's technically obese, yet be fit and be normal for your own genetics. 
Now, I won't get into the metabolism of fat cells too much, but I just want you to realize that there's two basic flavors of metabolism that are going on in your body. We either run on sugar, which comes from starches and, and sugar, and this is processed and put into our fat cells with the hormone insulin. This, this is a, a high insulin level uh, environment, and some people seem to work just fine on this. Many of us, however, accumulate too much fat, and there's a whole nother system, a complementary system of energy metabolism when insulin levels are low. When insulin levels are low, fat can come out of the fat cells, and the body is fully prepared to run on fatty acids and ketones rather than glucose, which is sugar. Here it is, after three and a half billion years of evolution, there it is, uh, and it works very well. In fact, the heart prefers to burn fatty acids rather than sugar, and the brain will burn up to two-thirds of its uh, energy as ketones and be very, very happy. So we need to get, if we're trying to lose weight, lower inflammation, treat polycystic ovarian syndrome, if we can get into a low insulin environment and run on these fuels rather than this fuel, generally good things happen. Now, I'm going to talk about genetics and monoculture versus diversity. Here's a field of monogenetic corn, for example. This corn is all pretty much the same, and as long as it's happy, it yields a lot, and that's why we do this. However, if there, a pest comes along, a bow weevil or a moth or something, or some kind of organism or insect, a predator, a pest, that will eat this type of corn, it will ravage this whole field, and it will be very vulnerable. In nature, that doesn't happen. We have diversity. We have all different species that live amongst it. We're not species and different subtypes of, uh, of whatever you, organism you want to look at here, and they're all different. So if there is a pest, it may uh, be harmful here, but it'll be resistant here, okay? Some of these are more drought resistant than others. Diversity is what allows uh, species to prosper. Uh, humans are no different. It turns out that if a human being has the genes for sickle cell anemia, they're protected from malaria, so it's not really a disease in that context. Uh, the disease cystic fibrosis can be really terrible if you have two genes, but if you have one gene for cystic fibrosis, it will protect you from childhood diarrhea. Childhood diarrhea is still the number one cause, and it all, has always been the number one cause of infant mortality throughout human history. Uh, people of European uh, descent can have something called hemochromatosis. No surprise, it protects from the plague. Uh, plague ravaged Europe back in the Middle Ages twice. So people with hemochromatosis were selected to live. Turns out type 1 diabetes, in fact, may protect against frostbite in the Arctic. Very, very interesting. Now, in the Arctic, if you're living off blubber, you don't need insulin. So type 1 diabetes, in fact, may be beneficial in some contexts. Now, it turns out polycystic ovarian syndrome makes women want to hold on to weight, hold on to their resources, and it makes them resistant to famine and drought and war, and it makes them very powerful, and in fact, physical labor may be, uh, uh, they may be more suitable for it, depending on what type of polycystic ovarian syndrome a woman has. So I want women to realize polycystic ovarian syndrome is not a disease. It's a cluster of traits, there's variable traits, and these traits can have tremendous advantages. I like to think of polycystic ovarian syndrome as something that sometimes causes subfertility, not infertility, subfertility. And all we have to do with women with polycystic ovarian syndrome is change the environment, go to the environment where that diversity and those, those genes were actually helpful and beneficial, and these women tend to blossom, their ovaries wake up, they have tons of eggs, and they in fact can become very, very fertile in the right context. It is not a disease. Now, this is a very, very important concept. If I teach you anything from this lecture, it is this concept. I bought gas the other day for my car. My car needs premium gasoline. I'm buying the 93 octane here. It just so happens that the calorie content of all these gasolines is identical. If you take a thimble full of any of these gasolines and burn it, it will create the same amount of heat. They are isocaloric. The calories are the same. If they had the same calories, why are there three different grades of gasoline here? Because each different molecule behaves differently in a different engine. 
This is not about calories. And when people say you can substitute one food for another because they have the same calories or maybe the same iron or the same whatever, they are not the same. This, is, this goes to dispel the calorie myth and it explains why you can't just substitute one food uh, for another in people with different metabolisms. There's different types of cars. Here is an old minivan. You can put low octane cheap gas in this car, in this minivan, and it runs just fine. That's the gas that's suited for this engine or this, for this metabolism by analogy. And by analogy, we also have human beings that I call supercars or sports cars. These are the thrifty people. These are the women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. These cars require high octane gas. It has nothing to do with calories. Nothing to do with calories. We have different metabolisms. And by analogy, when you drive this car off the lot, you have to put good gas in it, premium gas its entire life. You can't just put bad gas in it once it's running good and expect it to keep performing. That's why I like to get away from the word diet. This is not a diet. This is a lifestyle. This is a way of life. This car is not on a diet of premium gasoline. That's what it requires to function optimally, and that's the way it'll always be. Now, another thing that people don't like to talk about, sugar is addictive. When you eat something sweet, it creates rewards in the brain, and once these rewards get kicked in, judgment goes away. That's why addictions are baffling. It makes no sense when you stand back. It makes no sense. Why are, gee, why are you eating that entire tub of ice cream when the first bite or two uh, should have satisfied you? It's because you lose judgment once you kick in these rewards. One of my, uh, my nemesis is donuts. When I go to the surgeon's lounge in the morning in the hospital, the surgeon's lounge has a big pile of donuts in it. Uh, and sometimes I'll go, I'll just have a bite, and I'll tear a little bite off the donut. And once it hits uh, my taste receptors, I go, oh my goodness, I need another, I have another bite. And before you know it, I've gone through one, I've gone through two. Judgment has gone out the window. It's that first bite that gets you. So, realize that the idea of portion control makes about as much sense as alcohol control to an alcoholic. Once an alcoholic starts drinking, they can't stop at two or three drinks. You can't do that. Once you have a sugar addiction, once you start eating the sugar, you generally can't stop. You have that first potato chip, you're going to eat the whole bag, or at least that's my experience. So, realize that sugar is addictive and just try to avoid it completely. Now, the obesity crisis in America is worsening. And in fact, India and China are also seeing an explosion of obesity and diabetes as well. Missouri, where I am right now, now joins Mississippi and West Virginia, and 35% of our population or more is now obese. Not just overweight, overweight but obese. Okay? And this is worsening all the time. There's a great slide set you can get from the CDC showing this happening over the past couple decades. It happens to coincide with large-scale recommendations to eat less fat and eat more grains and carbohydrates. Uh, clearly something is going wrong here. Um, this is a national crisis, um, and it makes me very sad. I'm sorry this is happening. Hopefully we can uh, work around this. Now, here's an interesting story. I'm going to weave in some current events into this talk. Uh, uh, here's a lovely young lady uh, from Scandinavia who's been uh, working uh, with the United Nations and internationally to uh, address global warming. I think her, uh, her efforts are... Uh, and he's Greta. Greta. Her efforts are, are exemplary. However, apparently she has autism, and when I see her, she appears small and pale, and uh, she doesn't appear too well to me. Now, it's not fair to, to look at one person, but it turns out she's a vegan as well. Uh, she's under the impression that being a vegan is going to save the planet because eating meat apparently uh, causes increase in methane production. Well, Turns out that animal husbandry in, in modern CAFOs, where animals just eat corn and sit on a feedlot, increases the amount of methane in the atmosphere. However, pastured animals or wild fields of buffalo, millions of buffalo, in fact, sink 
carbon into the earth and they're generally carbon neutral and greenhouse gas neutral when they're raised uh, in a more sustainable natural fashion. So when people think that you've got to go vegan to save the planet because in our current system eating meat raises methane levels, you have to realize that the answer is not eat less meat, the answer is raise meat in a more uh, systemically friendly manner. Now there are people that are really tied to going to a plant-based diet, okay? And I, as I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, I believe they have ulterior motives. They want to say that a healthy but diet uh, needs to become uh, plant-based. And I couldn't argue more, more strenuously against this. Now, uh, a couple of days ago, my son and I went to an artifact auction and they were auctioning off arrowheads. And I was fortunate enough to be able to bid for and win uh, this artifact here. It's a beautiful projectile point. It's thousands of years old. It was clearly made with love and attention. They used a beautiful stone. But I promise you, this was not done as a hobby. This was done for life and to sustain his family or his or her family or tribe. This was life and death. And there are these artifacts everywhere. There's millions of them waiting to be discovered because this was the essence of life and health. And uh, you take me. I don't think you could ever convince me that eating meat hasn't been a very important part of the human diet essentially forever. The real cause of global warming is the massive consumption of, of petro, petrochemicals, these crude oil, natural gas, coal, these spew carbon dioxide uh, into the air. Natural gas with its fracking also increases uh, methane to, to a huge degree. And unfortunately, the permafrost in the Arctic is starting to thaw, and that's going to release enormous amounts of methane uh, into the air. Um, a little bit of methane that comes from cow burps uh, is trivial compared to this. So, given the fact that we're getting fatter and sicker, and global uh, climate change seems to be getting worse, this is absolutely the worst time to be going on a plant-based diet if we expect to stay lean and healthy and fit to face the problems that we can anticipate and we know are coming. Now, what do I eat? Well, I've taken some pictures of what I've been eating just over the past week or so. Um, and in fact, this morning I was so happy I went to put on this, these pants and this belt and I had to go yet another notch smaller. It gave me a small uh, uh, bit of happiness this morning going to yet another uh, link uh, closer uh, as my waist gets uh, smaller again, which makes me very happy. Now, this is what's working for me. Like they say, your mileage may, may vary. But what's been working for me now is I just don't eat breakfast anymore. I have a cup of coffee, some Splenda, some heavy cream, and I just don't eat breakfast. Now, there may be people for whom breakfast is a good idea. If I'm a farmer and I'm going to go out and work 12 hours in the field, maybe I need a big hearty breakfast. But given my situation, I just come to work it's not particularly as strenuous most days. Uh, I just skip breakfast. I'll be eating a fairly sensible uh, lunch, some protein, a little bit of salad or something. And then for my meal at dinner time, I'll eat something like a bowl of shrimp. It's very easy for me to do. I thaw out a, a pound of shrimp, I put them in a skillet, some olive oil, some hot sauce, fry them up, and this is what I ate last week. Um, and that's all I ate for dinner. I was very satisfied, full of nutrients, uh, kept my insulin levels very low. Another meal, I made this for my family the other day. Here's a chicken, a buck 49 a pound. Get a five pound chicken, cut it up, soak it in teriyaki sauce for a few hours, put it on the grill, combine this with some uh, tomatoes from my garden, a little mayonnaise, a delicious dinner, very short prep, type, uh, prep time, uh, kept my insulin levels low, my nutrients high, everybody was happy. Um, this is a big favorite of my family. This is bacon wrapped pork loins. You can put some apple slices in here. This is a little maple syrup my boy uh, poured over the top. It really doesn't add that many carbohydrates to it. It's abs absolutely delicious, uh, nutrient dense, a wonderful meal if you eat pork, and uh, uh, totally fits in a, a keto lifestyle. This has been a big favorite. My tomatoes have been blooming the past uh, couple months. I take tomato, bacon, mayo, wrap it in a leaf of lettuce, 
Who needs the stinking bread? Here's a bacon lettuce tomato wrap, absolutely delicious, no bread to be seen, full of nutrients, full of protein, full of vitamins, full of fat. Uh, what, what, what else could you ask for? It's fantastic. Uh, I had this the other night. I was out uh, for a dinner meeting. I was able to get a dozen oysters. I know this might not be your cup of tea. Uh, most folks in the Midwest, I mentioned eating fish and their nose wrinkles up. They don't even think about it. They, they, they were not raised eating good fish. I fortunately was raised eating good fish. And uh, a dozen oysters here. You can see you've got your yellow, you've got your vitamin C, you've got your lycopene here, some horseradish. It's really a complete meal and very little insulin required uh, to digest. So, if we want to put together a, a basic dietary recommendation for polycystic ovarian syndrome, it would include whole foods. I recommend you focus on the meat and the colors. Remember, corn is not a vegetable. If you're getting your colors, make sure you have a high fat or a high olive oil uh, type of dressing with your salad so you absorb the nutrients and not just pass them through your body. Now, this is generally the foundation of a wonderful human diet. It's particularly good for women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, somebody here has altered the food pyramid, which you know used to have 14, 10 to 14 servings of grains down here, and we put them way up here into the avoid category. And if you base your diet on the meat, the non-starchy vegetables, some dairy, some colorful uh, berries and whatnot, then this is, is probably a much more... Uh, uh, healthy diet, especially for people who are overweight or women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Here's a fun little paleo diet chart. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but my favorite line is here, is it a fruit or vegetable? And if it's yes, then is it corn? See, you know, when I was a kid, corn was a vegetable on the side of your plate on school lunches. Well, it turns out if it's corn, corn is a grain, knucklehead. Don't be, don't be fooled. Corn is a grain, not something you want to eat uh, in this dietary scheme. Now, what has this been doing for me? Well, this is what I was able to accomplish. This is me just a couple nights ago. I'm not this putting this up to show off or anything. I'm going. To, I'm putting this up to show you this is what's working for me. I'm getting healthier. I'm getting leaner. And this will apply to anyone else who has the same weight struggles that I have. So I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank Collectively Keto for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's really been a pleasure, and I look forward to working with you in the future, uh, uh, bringing health and uh, fertility to our clients and our patients. Thank you very much.